Greetings and welcome back. Today we have a very interesting integral. We have the integral from 0 to 1 of log 1 minus root 2x plus x squared divided by 1 minus root 3x, root 3 times x that is, plus x squared times 1 over x dx. And this sort of structure and these sort of coefficients for the x terms in the numerator and denominator were chosen for a very specific reason. What is that reason? Well, we're going to apply Feynman's trick to solve the integral, but the parameterization is going to be a bit different from the usual sort of parameterization you'll see me do. So because we're dealing with logarithms, we can treat this as a difference of logarithms, of course. We have log 1 minus x root 2 plus x squared minus the logarithm of 1 minus x root 3 plus x squared. So we could define an integral function i of the parameter alpha in a very interesting manner. We could define it as the integral from 0 to 1 of log 1 minus 2 sine alpha times x. So that would be 2x sine alpha plus x squared divided by x dx. Now take notice of the fact that for 2x to equal root 2, for 2 sine alpha to equal root 2, that is, we need alpha to be equal to pi by 4, correct? So that would be the target case. Well, one of the target case. The other target case would be alpha equal to, we need 2 sine alpha to equal root 3. So that means alpha should be equal to pi by 3 in this case. Okay, cool. And the target integral i is actually the difference of i at pi by 4 and i at pi by 3. Now, of course, we could also use some initial value for the integral function. So we could make use of alpha equal to 0 or alpha equal to pi by 2. Both cases will work out quite well. So let's try alpha at pi by 2. That gives us integral 0 to 1. Log 1 minus 2x sine of pi by 2 is just 1. And then we have plus x squared divided by x dx. Notice that the argument of the logarithm is just 1 minus x whole thing squared. So we write this as integral 0 to 1, log 1 minus x squared. Of course, this can be written as 2 times log 1 minus x divided by x dx. And to evaluate this integral, we'll expand the log 1 minus x term as an infinite series, which is the sum over the integers k from 1 to infinity of x to the k divided by k dx. Okay, cool. So this thing here is independent of the index variable k, and we have twice the integral from 0 to 1 of the sum over k from 1 to infinity of x to the k minus 1 divided by k dx. And of course, we can switch up the order of the operators here to get 2 times the sum over k from 1 to infinity of 1 by k times integral 0 to 1 x to the k minus 1 dx. And this is quite nice. That means we have 2 times the sum over k from 1 to infinity of 1 over k times x to the k, terribly sorry about that, x to the k divided by k, limits being 0 and 1. So in this case, we have 2 times the sum over k from 1 to infinity of 1 by k squared, which we recognize from the famous Basel identity to be pi squared by 6. So that means i of pi by 2 here is just pi squared by 3. Okay, cool. And now what? Well, it looks like we have a pretty solid plan in place. So we're going to differentiate with respect to the alpha parameter, giving us i prime of alpha on the left. And on the right, we switch up the operators to get the integral from 0 to 1 of the partial derivative with respect to alpha of log 1 minus, terribly sorry about that, 1 minus 2x sine alpha plus x squared divided by x dx. And on differentiating, we have integral 0 to 1, 1 by x, and here we'll have in the denominator the argument of our log function. And up top, we'll differentiate the argument by the chain rule. So we have to differentiate negative sine alpha, which is negative cosine alpha. So we have negative 2x cosine alpha dx, with the x terms canceling out quite nicely. And negative 2 cosine alpha integral 0 to 1 
dx divided by x squared minus 2x sine alpha plus 1. And the denominator here looks readily available for completing the square. So we'll take the entire function. We have x squared minus 2 times x times sine alpha. So we could use a sine square alpha and negative sine square alpha, of course, to balance things out. And then we have x minus sine alpha plus 1 minus sine square alpha, which we know to be cosine square alpha. So I'll just write it out here. And this implies that i prime of alpha equals, terribly sorry about that, negative 2 cosine alpha integral 0 to 1 of dx divided by x minus sine alpha squared I forgot the square up there, plus cosine square alpha. Okay, cool. And this is actually pretty cool because all we have now is a nice inverse tangent integral. So we have negative 2 cosine alpha divided by cosine alpha times inverse tangent of x minus sine alpha, terribly sorry about that, x minus sine alpha divided by cosine alpha with the limits being 0 and 1. So we have some cancellation outside and we can get rid of the negative sign if we switch up the limits. So we have two times inverse tangent of, in the zero limit, we get negative sine alpha by cosine alpha. And as x approaches one, we have inverse tangent of one minus sine alpha divided by cosine alpha. Now, the inverse tangent function is an odd function, so we can pop the negative sign outside, and the sine over cosine thing is, of course, tangent alpha, so that's quite convenient. It would be really cool if the other thing, the other argument of the inverse tangent function, is also a tangent. And it turns out it really is. 1 minus sine alpha divided by cosine alpha can be expanded as 1 minus cosine of pi by 2 minus alpha divided by sine of pi by 2 minus alpha. How is this thing useful? Well, 1 minus cosine of something divided by sine of that same something is the tangent of half that something. So we have tangent of pi by 4 minus alpha by 2, which is quite convenient indeed. So we have inverse tangent of tangent of pi by 4 minus alpha by 2. So this yields 2 times negative alpha minus pi by 4 plus alpha by 2. So negative alpha and plus alpha by 2 turn into negative alpha by 2. And that means we have negative sine pi by 2 minus alpha. That's the derivative of the integral function with respect to alpha. And that's quite convenient as well because now all we have to do is integrate with respect to alpha. And the integration is, well, trivial. We have i of alpha here on the left equal to negative pi by 2 times alpha minus alpha squared by 2 plus a constant of integration c. And to determine that constant, we need the initial value condition. That was i of pi by 2, which I messed up big time. How so? Let me show you exactly where. Yeah, right about here. No, right about there, where I invoke the series expansion for the logarithm function. So log 1 minus x equals negative of the sum over k from 1 to infinity of x to the k divided by k. Now if you're like me, and quite forgetful, you could do what I should have done, and that is derive this from the geometric series, that is 1 by 1 minus x equals the sum over k from 0 to infinity of x to the k. Integrating all of this gives us log 1 minus x outside, but with a negative sign. And on the right, we have the sum over k from 0 to infinity of x to the k plus 1 divided by k plus 1. And of course, you could shift the index variable to get a sum over k from 1 to infinity of x to the k divided by k. So yeah. That was extremely useful and something I should have invoked earlier, just to be extra careful. Anyway, so that means I just have to pop in lots of negative signs here, here, and here, and here. That looked kind of weird. And here, and here, and finally here, which means i of pi by 2 is in fact negative 
pi squared by 3. So we have negative pi squared by 3 here. And plugging in alpha equal to pi by 2 into our equation gives us negative pi squared by 3 equal to negative pi squared by 4, right? Minus pi squared by 8 plus c. So this thing here, what is this? This is one of those, oh, wait, wait. Negative pi squared by 4. 1 plus 1 half. This is that kind of thing, right? So that's 3 halves. So that means I got negative 3 here and 8 down here, correct? Man, I hope I do not fuck this up. So this implies that c here equals mm, 3 pi squared by 8 minus, uh, f yeah, pi squared by 3. So that means, no factoring this time, I got 9 pi squared minus 8 pi squared divided by 24. So C here has a really nice value. That's pi squared by 24. Okay, cool. If I picked alpha equal to 0, it would have been a lot easier for me. Anyway, that was the hard bit. So now what? Oh, right. We have to recall exactly what we derived. We derived I of alpha equal to the constant, the constant C pi squared by 24 minus pi by 2 times alpha minus alpha squared by 2. And now for the target cases. Now, given my toxic relationship with basic math, I should be using a calculator, but I can't find mine anywhere in the house. And I'm not going to use my phone's calculator just to give me that extra challenge while recording the solution development. So here we go. I hope I survive. We got pi squared by 24. I, nothing to it because I just had to, well, note it down from the above equation. So yeah, nothing difficult over there except for the fact that I forgot how to write the number four. Minus pi squared by eight, minus pi squared by 32, right? And this is nice because I can factor out pi squared by 8, as far as my knowledge is concerned. Then we got 1 third minus 1 minus 1 quarter. What the hell is this? Wait a minute. I'm going to take, take things slow. One challenge at a time. So we got 1 third minus a quarter equal to uh, 4 minus 3 divided by 12, right? So that's like 1 12. Oh, that's zeta negative 1. Hell yeah. I can simplify this further. I could just leave it as zeta negative 1 minus 1. I mean, why not? But here I'm supposed to get negative 11 by 12. So that's negative 11 pi squared by 96. Okay, cool. That's i of pi by 4. Now, what about i of pi by 3? I'm going to have to copy this down. And there we go. So I of pi by 3. So we're going to write pi squared by 24. That was the easy part. Hell yeah. Minus pi squared by 6. And uh, the square of 3 is supposed to be 9. So we got pi squared by 18. Okay, cool. Now I can factor out pi squared by 6, which is nice because I got a quarter again. Minus one, minus one third. Isn't this exactly the same thing? Nah, the one third and the quarter are flipped up. And who knows what that means, for God's sake. So we got uh, negative one twelfth. Oh, that's zeta negative one, not the, not the one twelfth. I forgot the sum of all the natural numbers should be a negative number. I'm just kidding. I actually have a short video on that, on why zeta negative one is negative 1 12th is because of the functional equation valid for real part of s being less than 1. Okay, cool. So we got negative 1 here, so that's going to be negative 13 by 12. So that's negative 13 pi squared by 72. So this implies that the target integral equals negative 11 pi squared by 96 plus 13 pi squared by 72. Nope, I'm using my calculator. Hell no, nah, man, hell no. Nah. Where's my phone? There we go. So, where's the calculator app? 
not the default one, the other one, the cool one with, where I can, you know, input fractions with those two empty boxes, that kind of thing. So we got negative 11 by 96 plus 13 by 72. And this gives me a positive value. So I here equals 19 pi squared by 288. And I always write the number 8 in that form, but as two balls stacked on top of each other. But let's give that a different try now. Oh, that looked quite nice. That, what is that? What is that? Oh, man. Why is writing this so difficult? Oh, that doesn't look half bad at all. So that's the target integral, and I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something from the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Drop me a follow on Instagram, and in case you like the effort I put into my work, consider supporting my work on Patreon. It would mean the world to me. Thank you. See you next time.